Good morning once again. Good morning. Um, some announcements. Uh, next week it's time to change the clocks. So please fall back to be at church at the right time. Richard Jordan will be having a procedure on November 5th to insert a new heart valve. Instead of opening his chest again, they're gonna, it's called a, it's a TAVL, but you can go through a groin up the blood stream and plant it in there. And they also put a net in his main artery that's going to the brain because some parts of the clog that he had, the heart clog or the, the blood, might be getting up there and, 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 and confusing him when he's talking like that. So, um, so that's that's a good thing. When they when they said he was going to have to have open heart surgery again, you know, um, I never had that, but you know, people don't want it. I can't blame them. And there is a Bible conference next week, Saturday, this November second, in Middlebury, Indiana. A flyer is on the table uh, on the book table, and uh, we do take down the tables today. I usually forget to say that, but it's, uh, Gene always corrects me. Just like a dutiful wife, right? <laughs> um, this is Second Thessalonians lesson number 78. Um, I was in Matthew 17 not long ago, and when uh, Peter, James, and John, they, they, in the Mount of Transfiguration, they meet Moses and Elijah, and who they had never seen, but they automatically knew who, who they were. But I've been thinking about Dawn. And uh, I think that when we get up there, we'll hear Dawn's laugh first before we see her, because it's so contagious. That's what I think. And at the end of my teaching today, I'm going to show again the verses to prove conclusively there's more than one gospel taught in the Bible. Okay, at the end of it. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. So it's rightly dividing this the proper order. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, and for what you continually offer us as a, as a people around the world. The, the salvation is a free gift. Amen. Last week we talked about the, the six beginnings. We continue. If you go to Revelation, I mean, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me just read you 13 and 14 again. We're going to be focusing on verse 14 more, more than 13. It says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. No, I'm wrong one. Ray, just get over there. Okay. Second Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. That always is a word. doesn't need an S in there. For you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chose you to salvation. How? through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the salvation in, in verse 13 is from the events of the day of the Lord, which I talked about in the last message. This is where the day of the Lord comes. It's not the day of Christ. Anytime you look up the day of Christ, it's always something good. Number two, the deception of the Antichrist. It's that, it's not that, it, he's not going to deceive you. It says, we, understanding this message, understanding that you're saved, that you can't lose your salvation, that you, you beat, beat Satan. This message, Paul's message, is what takes the devil out, out of the picture. Can he tempt us? Can our own flesh tempt us in things, doing things? You all know that, because we're still sinning. But this message, it, well, I'll talk about it later on. So verse 13 is from the events of the day of the Lord, the deception of the Antichrist, and the lie program. Let me ask you a question here about verse 14 and try to decide which beginning is this. In the six beginnings, in the six beginnings last week, we today fit into number six, time-wise, Pauline truth, 
soul salvation and saved from the prophesied wrath to come. It was from the time when Paul's gospel began to be preached and is, is what called, called these people to the salvation. Could Paul's gospel call them to salvation before it was preached? No. How could it do it then? If you don't know about it, it can't call you. It's that simple. And the easiest way is to just read the text and leave it like it is. It is to understand that from the beginning of the time of that Paul's gospel was preached, that is, from the beginning of the dispensation of grace and the formation of the church, the body of Christ, which I was able to get across at the wedding, the church today is the body of Christ. Christ has been chosen, I'm sorry, body of Christ, has been chosen, prefixed, predestinated by God to be saved from the time of wrath known as the tribulation and the, and the day of the Lord and the wrath to come. Now, predestination is not fully understood. It's a doctrine that certain people have been elected for salvation. We talked about election. It has to do nothing with choosing but service. And sometimes also that others are destined for reprobation. The state the state of being abandoned to eternal destruction. So they think there's people saved beforehand by God and people not saved. And the people who are saved don't feel any compelling reason to give the gospel, but they do it because it tells them to do it in the Bible. But they miss the key point, our volition. We, we get to believe. We have the uh, From Genesis to Revelation, we have volition, believing. Um, in other words, no volition. We are members of the church, the body of Christ. The body of information was kept secret. Only the, the Godhead knew about it. He waited until Paul gets saved in order to release it to mankind. Romans 16, 25 talks about the preaching of the uh, revelation of the mystery. It's what we preach. How did we get to be members of the church, the body of Christ, and all things that pertain to this? We believe Paul's gospel the body of Christ was predestinated, not us. So if you have a train going from L.A. to New York, you're going to New York. Your, your predestination is New York. How do you get to New York? Get on the train or buy a ticket. How do you get saved today? How are you going to be in the body of Christ? Believe that Jesus Christ, believe Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace, not the gospel of the kingdom. And you're going to see, see conclusively that you can show there's more than one gospel in the Bible. But a lot of people choose not to recognize this. And that's, that's up to them. We have free will. Um, let me see here. This is why, that's why 1 Timothy 1.10 says, And wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. How can you get any clearer than that? Is that something hard to believe? Well, if you're brought up in a religion, it is. But when something strikes you the right way, when you preach, uh, like yesterday, the, the, the people, the photographers, they were right, right dividers, dividers. And people heard the word, the church, the body of Christ. They heard that. That's the church today. Um, because that's the Lord's purpose for us. We've been made a new creature. Do you believe Genesis 2 7, when the Lord put some dust out of the earth and blew on it, man became a living soul? Do you believe that? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Could he create another creature? He can do anything, right? If you wanted to. We are like a creature within a creature. We're made a new creature. We're a human, but we're made a new creature. Not yet. Okay? We have the information about it. That's what we try to get across to people. Um, and it's up to them if they want to believe or not. Um, a new creature, the, the, the one new man. Why? 
The answer is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Two realms of activity. We're going to get a new body like Jesus Christ. We're going to serve the Lord in the heavenly kingdom. We need a new body to do this, which we have in Philippians 3.21, which says, who shall, change, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he, hath, he is able to s subdue all things unto, unto himself. But we're going to get a new body. Jesus Christ, we're going to get a body like Jesus Christ because the bodies we have, we can't live in that spiritual realm. It's out there now. Back to your outline. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We're a creature within a creature. The people in, in Israel, back the gospel of the kingdom, they're, they're not going to be changed in a new creature. They'll be resurrected when, if they're saved, but not like us. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. A creature is a thing created. Old things are the gospel of the kingdom. New things are the gospel of grace. Galatians 6.15 for, for in Christ Jesus, neither a circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Can you believe that? A new creature. How come he's not concerned with circumcision anymore? Because he changed the dispensation, he's forming a new body of people that are going to be with him and have, serve with him in the heavenly places. To me, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 is one of the greatest passages of the pre-tribulation nature of the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace. Let me read you Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. Now, all the things I'm talking about, all you folks have heard many times. Ephesians 2, verse 14. Let me start at verse 12. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in our world. This is the way we were from Genesis 12 until Paul. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Between the temple, you're going to the temple, there was a middle wall outside of the, the temple. If you pass that, you're good as, good as dead. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And then he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Romans 11, 15 talks about God reconciling the world. He wants to draw the whole world to him. Get everybody saved. That's, just not, he, he, that's what he wants to do. It's not going to happen. But that's, that's our, our job now as members of the body of Christ. And it's not going to get the whole world. We know that. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Now, this is a very interesting part of the body, Bible. Charity never faileth, but whether the prop, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So the prophecies will fail, Tongues will cease, and the knowledge, which is supernatural, foretelling something, will vanish. If you remove Paul's 13 epistles from the Bible, all the other books were already written. Okay? When Paul finished 2 Timothy, the Bible... God's word to mankind were finished. So he wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books, 
He wrote half the New Testament. And people still have a hard time believing that there's more than one gospel. Here's the verse I was going for. 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when, that, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Why? The context in this passage is knowledge. Peter, James, and John recognized and endorsed Paul's message. Now that which, which is in part, definition, partial? Any problem understanding that? Unfinished? Incomplete? But it also throws in there immature. Be a man, don't be a mouse, kind of thing. That which is perfect, definition, brought to its end, finished, full-grown, adult, of full age, mature. So you have immature and mature. Immature and mature. Immature and mature. Okay? This is the reason Paul writes the following. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. A mature man thinks first in order to understand, then he speaks. Any problem with that? Okay. This verse and others prove that doctrinal, doctrinal maturity equals Pauline truth. You can be saved. Genesis 3.15 talks about the two comings of Christ. And, and, then, and then the following verses kind of to verify, Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with, with his stripes are we healed. He is writing to Israel. Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the foundation for both messages. Remember I talked to you about the duplex? Two houses, but the same basement? Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were war in Christ before me. They were kinfolk, Jewish Christians, before Paul and this dispensation. Books, other books write about this. No, they were Gentiles and this and no. You, if you were in Christ before Paul, you were a Jewish Christian. They didn't even bring up the word Christian until Acts chapter, I think it's 20, 11, 1126. They were the king book, Jewish Christians. First Timothy 1.14, it says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Was Peter, James, and John, were Peter, James, and John before Paul? Why does Paul and me first? Say me first. Romans 12, let me read you verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants us to be, he wants all men to be saved, then to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right now, what I'm preaching is the knowledge of the truth. When I was preaching Peter, James, and John back here, again, we don't separate truth from error, we just separate truth from truth. This was true about Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. But in this dispensation, he's dealing with mankind in a different way, in a different way, under grace, not law. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, be, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect, mature will of God. All right? If you're not preaching Pauline truth, he, he doesn't consider you fully mature. Now, granted, us men, we never really grow up all the time, you know, and things like that. But I'm talking about scriptural, scripture here, not between husband and wife. And 
it's it's amazing. Now, when Debbie and I got into this message, we were it, it allows you to see so many things that you never saw before in your life. Um, go go to Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight. And let me read you verses 10 through 15. Luke chapter 8, 10 through 15. Parable of the sower. And he said, this is the earthly ministry of Christ now. He's only preaching to the Jews. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, Put to others in parables that, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. You guys remember what this is? God's going to give you what you want. They're not going to understand it. He's going to speak in parables. They're not going to see it or hear it or they're not going to believe it. Now the parable, parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with, with joy, these have no root, which for a while believe, and in times of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But on the good ground are they which is an honest and good, which is an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth, bring forth fruit with patience. So in verse twelve, people that hear the word of God, but they don't, but they, they, they don't believe, the devil has taken them over. Number thirteen, verse thirteen, the words of God falls on stones, having no root. They, they believe before a while, but in time of temptation, they fall away. Again, we're all still sinners. We might be tempted too, but this, the difference between this dispensation and the one before us is that once you're saved, you can beat Satan if you do what God's word says. He doesn't have to keep you unfaithful for, for everything. As you start learning here, as we start growing it, you're going to think of things differently and make, make this different decisions. You all saw the, the pictures of me when I was 18 and 23. Is there a difference between then and there? It's a big difference. I just didn't have a beard like, like back there. <laughs> Rick, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Senior moments. Um, I never got the beard, but yeah. Verse 14, the words of God fell among them, the thorns like the weeds, and are choked by, by cares and riches and pleasures of this life, bring no fruit to perfection, to maturity. This is if you believe there's only one gospel. In verse 14, there, the, the word of God that falls on good ground brings forth fruit with patience. How many in here think they're really patient? Why does everybody laugh when I say I'm the most patient guy in the world? Because you know I'm not. <laughs> I don't have any problem with that. Now that I know the word of God, God takes everybody and anybody that believes in his word. Okay. Paul, through his God-given message, wanted all men to be saved. He is our pattern for salvation. First Timothy 1.16 talks about that. Now in verse 14, he says other things. 4.16, First Corinthians 4.16 he says, wherefore, be, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Is he talking about Peter, James, and John? He says, me. He says, he calls it my gospel three times. Paul and Peter, they never said that. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, is there anything hard to understand about that? I know I'm asking the question. But these are 
If you're a Bible believer, you believe the words on the page, and these are what the words are saying. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, And ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. We have that guy living in us right now. Ephesians 5, 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Philippians 3, 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as he have us for an example. Let me read you Galatians chapter 2, just in case you have any questions. And if you believe there's no more, there's more than there's only one gospel in the Bible. I'll sit down with you at any time, and we can we can swap verses or look to new verses. Now this is the Council of Jerusalem, breaking into verse six through nine. Peter says, "Now he sees all these Jewish men and these learned people, but of these who seem to be somewhat, what sober they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person." For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing new to me. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter, newer Bibles change that, okay, make it in one gospel. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, they were before, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, that's all unsaved Jews and Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. No Bible's put on circumcision, but it's the heathen. So when God looks down here, he only sees saved and unsaved people. Until the Apostle Paul came on the scene, we had partial knowledge of God's word. How do I know this? Colossians 1.25 says, Where if I am made a minister according to the dispensation of grace, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the gospel, the word of God, to fulfill the word of God. Love in the Bible is three things. Charity, choice, and forgiveness. Charity is a love that is committed to truth. This goes all the way back to verse 13 again. Paul is comparing gifts in the first part of that chapter to works, to charity. Gift and works to charity. He's comparing that. After Acts 28... All these gifts cease. You know, gifts of uh, tongues and things like that. The six epistles he wrote in Acts period, he wrote Galatians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Corinthians and Romans. 2 Corinthians and Romans were written in Acts chapter 20. You remember in Acts 28, Paul was bit by a viper. He didn't swell up, he didn't die. He just shook the snake off his hand. You remember that Paul on, on that on island there, he healed the father of Publius? He had a sin, and Paul put his hands in him, and the guy recovered. Is that happening today? Can we pray over somebody, pour oil on them, and have them recover? Are, are we given that power? Do people think they have the power? Yes. Do they have the power? Right. Paul says to Timothy, I'm sorry, in Philippians 2, Epaphroditus was sick and nigh unto death. His people loved him. He says, I sent him therefore the more carefully. He wasn't healed. He had to get, Paul probably told him to wait a little while longer, but he didn't want to wait. 1 Timothy 5, 23, Paul says to Timothy, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine often." Infirmities, then off infirmities. How come Paul couldn't heal him? Second Timothy four twenty. Somebody's laughing at me. That's okay. I'm tough. I can take it. Um, Trophimus. 
Have I left in Miletum sick? Now that's an ancient seaport in Asia Minor, Minor visited by Paul. Fulfill means to make full, to fill it up. Example, to fill it to the full. It's not 10 pounds of truth in a five pound bag, if you get my understanding. Okay? It's the last five pounds, Paul's message is, to the 10 pound bag. 2 Timothy 4.17 says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known, completely filled up, and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. That means to fully known, to carry out fully, with evidence, entirely accomplish, fully know, you read about uh, Abraham being persuaded in Romans 4, Make full proof of being del- make full proof of being delivered out of the mouth of the lion. In the context, a type of Satan, the devil, and our adversary. First Peter five eight says something about this. It says, "Be sober and vigilant, vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour." You see, the devil compared to that all the time. Okay. Genesis 3.15, the proto-evangel, says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall, fully, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And I will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman, and between thy, Satan's seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, Satan's head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Um, then the seed of the woman becomes the seed of man. Hebrews 2.16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, way back in the first book ever written, Job, what's so funny over there? Um, Job says in chapter 40, verse 19, and he's talking about the Antichrist, he is chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make a sword to approach unto him. What does Romans 16, 20 say? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you again. Amen. Ephesians 6.17, the sword of the Spirit, is, which is the word of God. What message? Does the gospel of the kingdom do that to, to Satan, to the, the behemoth? Paul's gospel does this. The only way to get Satan is to use Pauline's sword, which is his 13 epistles, to stick the monster. You can keep him away with his words in your, in your, in your mind and in your heart. You can't. You don't have to do that sin that you did before because you have some words telling you not to do that. If that makes any sense. Paul's gospel of the grace of God, our message in this dispensation, is what beats Satan at his own game. Had Satan known Paul's ministry, the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God, the revelation of the mystery, Christ would not have been crucified. I'll read that passage in a minute. Remember reading the phrase, led captivity captive? Okay. It's used twice. Once in Psalm 18, eight, uh, Psalm 68, verse 18. And Paul quotes it in Ephesians 4, 18. 4, 8. Getting mixed up here. Basically, it means turning the table out, tables on your uh, oppressor, Satan. You can't read about the cross in the Old Testament. You can read about the cross in the Old Testament, but its full meaning comes to light in today's dispensation, which is why Paul quoted Ephesians 4.18, okay? Leading captivity captive. This message beat the devil. Had Satan known about what the cross accomplished, he would not have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Ascension, again, this is only found in Paul's epistles, which is why we have Romans 16.20, the Church of Body of Christ has the right gospel to beat Satan, which is why we have 2 Timothy 4.18, we're going to be with him in, in, in the heavenly kingdom, we're going to serve him in the heavenly kingdom, 
which is why we have Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and why we have Genesis 3-15, the two advents of Christ. So Galatians 1-10, no, Galatians 1, I forget what that is. Okay, to summarize, had Satan known the gospel of grace, Jesus Christ would not have been crucified. Let me see something here. Let me read you that passage. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among, among them that are perfect. Again, that means mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Satan is called the prince of this world. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world under our glory. He predestinated the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. My twin sisters, this is the passage that got them. To summarize, had Satan known about the gospel of the grace of God, Jesus Christ would not have been crucified, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And speaking about today's church, the body of Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 26, then he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You clean your body with water, don't you? The word, you pour it through your brain and you, you learn how to write the divide and it gets clearer and clearer. Acts 20, 24 to 25. But none of these things move me, Paul's talking, neither count on my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Here's what Paul says in, in 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord preserved me unto his heavenly kingdom. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He talks about the earth first before we get to Paul and he talks about heaven. He says in 1 Timothy 1.11, According to, the glorious, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. We also have been entrusted with this body, a precious body of information. We've been given that trust. That's why whenever I, I make mistakes sometimes, you know, I, you, you kick yourself afterwards. And you don't want to get anything wrong, but sometimes you do. You know, but you don't want to do it. And I know the Lord knows all this, but you still, you still, I still have trouble when, when I do it. Everybody does, every preacher does. But because you're up here teaching and you want the people to believe it because you believe it. And First Timothy 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Here it is. But as we, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men which try their hearts. If you're a Christian and you don't preach Pauline truth, you are not pleasing God. First Corinthians, Galatians 1.10 For do I not persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Remember last week when I stood here and I told, this is my spot when I preach. You know, I'm going to say anything I believe. But when I get out of the pulpit, I don't act the same way. Because, you know, but... Here, I'm going to go up, I'm going to preach it. And people still get mad at you anyway, but religion does this. But if somebody tells you you have to work to get saved, or work to show you're saved, or work to stay, to stay saved, it's wrong. It can't be an appointed, you can't be an appointed, I'm sorry, you can't be an approved servant without Pauline truth. Study that they show that stuff approved unto God, and work from that need, it's not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Ephesians 3, 8 to 9, Unto me, Paul says, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given? That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
unsearchable riches. They didn't know that. People didn't know that before Paul. They were unsearchable. Now, when you look back, knowing the message, you can see where God snuck one in every now and then. That's, that's his humor. You know, there can no secret that be, can be kept from me. Well, there was a secret that he kept away from, 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 from the people. He, he, he took a type of the Antichrist and made him the apostle of the Gentiles. Didn't he? And to make all men see what is this fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God. Isn't that what I've been talking about? I mean, hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 25, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. How many times do you have to read it before you're going to believe it? Within this previously secret, secret body of information, other mysteries have been made known. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.1, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What's some of the differences? Salvation is available for all people, circumcised or uncircumcised. Once saved, always saved. And there's more truths. But there's no more miracles, signs, and wonders. I thought... If you really want to see a miracle down here, when your wife has a baby, go watch that procedure. And if you don't get some tears in your eyes, you're not a man. Okay? And I was there for both of them. She was knocked out the first one. They had to do a C-section, and I held her up, and the first thing she did was pee. She'd be doing that from now on. but. Um, What did I say? Well, it made it sound like it was Debbie that you held oh, up I'm, that she peed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you held up her baby. I do call her baby. <laughs> right, baby? <laughs> okay, the baby peed. <laughs> but she was put out. I was, I was, you know, I saw the placenta and everything. Okay, let me finish here. <laughs> I made a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get up here and see if you can do any better. <laughs> Titus 3 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Here we go. How to prove there's more than one gospel taught in the Bible. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 15, verses 1 to 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. I was preaching to both Jews and Gentiles, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Anybody believe any differently from that? That's the gospel that saves, right? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that's talked about in the Old Testament. Can you see that this gospel it's all about Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Okay. But this was after the cross. In Paul's writing. Let's see what Christ preached during his earthly ministry. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 to 6. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Wow, some people think they can still do that. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, 
Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. Whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. Now, two years later in Scripture, I'm sorry, and they departed and went through the town preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Thank you for that. Two years later, the same people in Luke 18, 31 to 34, which says, Then he took on, unto him the twelve and said unto them, Before we go up to Jerusalem, and it always says up because they were elevated higher than the city, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. This has nothing to do with Paul. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And then what does it say? And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. And they talk about anything about the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of the cross. They were still out there preaching the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom. Is that a different gospel? Were they preaching good news to Israel? Sure, about the coming of Messiah. The prophesied coming. Did they preach anything about Paul? Paul wasn't even on the scene. I mean, he might have been a bit alive, but it wasn't Pauline truth. It wasn't what God gave to Paul. Satan, Paul gave us the secret meaning of the cross. For had Christ known what the cross, uh, the, Satan known what the cross work accomplished, Christ would not have been crucified. They knew nothing about the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, yet they had been preaching a gospel. So what gospel had they been preaching those two years? It could not have been about the cross. Is there more than one gospel in the Bible? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for these words and for the Powerful effect this has in us when we, you know, when we understand this message, especially about the message you gave to the Apostle Paul, which teaches us everything that you wanted to tell the whole world anyway. I say this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. Just die.